Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think we are ready to start. Uh, my name is Luis Aguirre Torres, and I am the Director of Financial Plan and Analysis and Financing Solutions at NYSERDA. Uh, and part of our group's mandate is to manage the Green Jobs Green New York Residential Fund and to coordinate with other groups within NYSERDA in relation to the work they perform related to Green Jobs Green New York. We can go to the next slide, please. Before we start, a few reminders to ensure a smooth and respectful discussion. If you are present, uh, please feel free to speak up, participate, initiate discussion and ask questions by simply indicating you wish to do so by raising your hand. If you are online, the WebEx platform has a raise hand function that would indicate to those coordinating this meeting that you wish to participate. At any time, we ask you to, uh, to use the mute function to avoid feedback or background noise and interrupting the meeting. When you speak, please indicate your name and organization to provide context to your question and comments. For those participating via WebEx, uh, we invite you to come on video when participating. If for any reason you cannot do this, please simply indicate uh, when you unmute. Thank you very much, everybody, again, for being here. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, now, I would like to start by recognizing those uh, members of the Advisory Council that are present today, either in the room or via WebEx. Uh, if you could just indicate that you are here when I name you uh, Elizabeth Cooper. And attendees, uh, John, can attendees uh, speak too? The attendees would need to raise their hand to speak because I would need to unmute them. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to name the ones that uh, we believe are present here uh, or in WebEx. And if I am missing anybody, please raise your hand so we can uh, take note of you being present. We have Elizabeth Cooper, Molly Streb, Hal Smith, Les Luston, Vincent Ravasher, Michael Weisberg, and Jane Thompson. If I miss anybody, please raise your hand so we can know that you are present in the meeting. Okay. So if we can go to the uh, next slide, please. So again, thank you very much uh, to the members of the advisory council for being here. Uh, today, we have a full agenda, and the intention is to cover the different programs uh, that are part of Green Jobs in New York. Uh, we will go over uh, initially uh, some of the program updates, starting with single family residential, multifamily, and small commercial, and then we'll hear some proposed changes for the Green Jobs Green New York financing uh, program. Uh, these will follow uh, a discussion where we hope and expect that you will participate and let us know what you think. Uh, then we'll talk about workforce training, community-based outreach, and then the evaluation work specifically for single family, multifamily, residential, small commercial. Uh, but first, before we start, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Pam Poisson, Chief Financial Officer at NYSERDA, who, on behalf of Doreen Harris, President and CEO of NYSERDA and Chair of the Green Jobs Green New York Advisory Council, will present the President's report. Pam? Thank you, Luis. Um, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I know Doreen would have wanted to be here if she could. She was called away for another matter, matter that she must attend to and sends her regrets. Um, but I'm honored to be able to deliver the President's report on her behalf. And not only do I appreciate your presence, but also I appreciate all the work the NYSERDA team here has done to put together a great presentation for you. It's really some incredible work. I think that the Green Jobs Green New York program makes possible. Um, I've been with NYSERDA now for three years, and I've been very impressed by how the teams are cross-coordinating and delivering so much under the umbrella of this program. And so let me share some highlights with you to get us started. It's been a while since the meeting of this council. So in the president's report today, I'd like to share some highlights from our recently updated strategic plan. 
also provide some insight on historic funding opportunities that will undoubtedly shape our work here at NYSERDA in the years to come. At NYSERDA, we recognize that we are at an intersection that's full of opportunities to advance our efforts in partnership with local, state, and federal government, as well as private partners from across a variety of sectors to realize the clean energy transition in New York and beyond. I'll briefly begin with the strategic outlook that NYSERDA assembles. It's a policy document intended to guide our work over the next three years. This was just presented to and approved by the NYSERDA board at the end of April. As we shared with our board, under Governor Hochul's steadfast leadership and support, in the coming three years, NYSERDA will maintain our core responsibilities, advancing clean energy innovation and investments, working to combat climate change, improving the health, resiliency, and prosperity of New Yorkers, and finally, delivering benefits equitably to all New Yorkers. In each facet of our work, NYSERDA seeks to maximize our impact in the marketplace through our various roles. As a starting point, the focus of NYSERDA's work is on the execution of a broad range of our key programs. These primarily include market acceleration programs, like those dealing with supply chain challenges, where we are removing finance and customer awareness barriers, and also resource development or deployment programs, such as our large-scale renewables and offshore wind procurement programs, as well as targeted incentive programs for school buses. Secondly, NYSERDA has a key policy and analysis role. Work on the design and implementation of new programs or changes to existing ones are underscored by policy design and analysis, as well as more general foundational analysis that simply underpin all that we do. How we approach our work is important as well. As we pursue our work, it's critical that NYSERDA focuses on minimizing cost and maximizing benefits. Equally critical is how we consider equity and resiliency in everything that we do. Of course, as we work to achieve this, we recognize that we must leverage successful partnerships with other state agencies, communities across the state, key market actors, and others. The strategic outlook itself is organized by six mission outcomes for NYSERDA. First, greenhouse gas emission reduction. That really provides an overarching umbrella. Then, a sector focus on clean electricity, clean and efficient buildings, and clean transportation. And those are tied to the delivery of clean energy jobs in the economy and sustainable and climate resilient communities. So those six mission outcomes all weave together, and I won't be able to give you an in-depth review of the content here, but I do strongly encourage and hope that you will review our strategic outlook. It provides important additional context for the presentations you'll hear during the meeting today. An extraordinary opportunity area I would also like to highlight before closing is the historic amount of federal funding now available to accelerate the United States clean energy transition. In 2021 and 2022, the federal government, as you likely know, passed a trio of laws, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IAJA, the Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors, or CHIPS and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. By doing so, the federal government approved the largest amount of federal funding and many of the most consequential policies ever to directly address climate and energy issues in our nation's history. This federal funding will be an important complement to New York State's robust policy agenda and program portfolios. In particular, the passage of new tax credits has the potential to unlock significant private investment in new and emerging technologies. More than half of the climate and energy funding approved in the IRA was authorized in the form of tax credits. New York's scoping plan estimates that the IRA alone 
can reduce the state's cost to meet the Climate Act's requirements by up to 70 billion by 2050. It's a pretty significant number. And so our approach to leveraging federal funding at NYSERDA is multi-purposed. We're aiming to reduce costs to New Yorkers, advance progress toward Climate Act goals, ensure that benefits are delivered to underserved and historically marginalized communities, creating new jobs, reducing emissions, and tying it all together by developing infrastructure while also driving significant health and economic benefits for those in our state. Importantly, we're not only applying for funding to directly support New York State and NYSERDA programs, but also working to support the broader market to capture these funds. So for instance, we're assisting by conducting outreach to ensure our partners are aware of the available tax credits. We're submitting comments on draft IRS and Treasury guidance to help support the adoption of technologies in the market. And we're providing letters of support for industry and academic partners to secure funding. Specific to NYSERDA, we've seen a huge amount of progress in this space over the past year, especially momentum in the past month and a half alone. The Federal Climate Pollution Reduction Grants Program, for instance, or CPRG, would make up to 5 billion available to states, local governments, tribes, and territories for programming to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. NYSERDA, as part of a DEC-led partnership, is advancing New York's $3 million planning grant approved under the CPRG. On April 1st, we and sibling agencies submitted two applications under two different funding tiers to the EPA for consideration. And we expect the EPA to announce the grant winners sometime this summer. Just a few days later, on April 4th, the EPA announced awardees under the IRA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, including what's called the National Clean Investment Fund, or NCIF. Our New York Green Bank, as a sub-awardee to that $5 billion Coalition for Green Capital Award, is now finalizing terms to bring a very sizable award to support new capital investment for New York State. And then, third in sequence here, just two weeks later, on April 18th, we received word from DOE that our $39.6 million partial scope application under the Home Electrification and Appliance Rebates, or HERE program, was approved. And that will provide efficiency and electrification improvements primarily to low-income New Yorkers. New York State notably was the first state in the country to have secured funds under the Home Energy Rebate programs under the IRA. And we are now finalizing our application to bring a total of nearly 318 million under the two home energy rebate programs from DOE, HER and HERE, to deliver benefits to New Yorkers. And finally, the fourth in uh, sequence here on Earth Day, we received more great news from the EPA. I'm very happy to share that New York State was awarded 249.8 million under the Solar for All program. That's one of three competitions under the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We had submitted the Solar for All application on behalf of New York State alongside our partners at the Division of Housing and Community Renewal and also the City of New York. And the funding will allow that trio to keep up the incredible momentum of deployment of solar across New York State, including through NYSERDA's New York Sun program. So, as you can see, April was a great month for all of us here in New York State in terms of our federal engagement. I commend the teams involved, and on behalf of Doreen Harris, our CEO, I want to express appreciation for the great work they did. It was not an insignificant effort to assemble these successful funding applications, and I'm grateful to them and for the continued recognition of New York's energy and climate leadership by our federal government partners. Finally, turning to Green Jobs Green New York and its impact. It's hard to believe, but it has been 15 years since the passage of the Green Jobs Green New York Act. During this time, in full alignment with NYSERDA's mission, the program has constantly increased its impact, positively affecting the lives of millions of New Yorkers. 
And today, Green Jobs Green York includes support for low-income house, households and disadvantaged communities, equitable workforce training, affordable financing options, and new and better ways of incentivizing community participation. And a lot of that is because of your involvement and support. So as you hear more today about the diligent progress that we've made as we move through our agenda, I hope you understand the thanks and sincere appreciation that comes from us to you as you help us improve this program, making a difference in the lives of so many New Yorkers. I'll turn it back over to Luis now so he can introduce the ongoing work of the Green Jobs Green New York Residential Funding Team. And thank you. I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much, Pam. Uh, uh, this was a great uh, summary of all the work that's been going on uh, at NYSERDA and in New York State. Uh, at this point, I would like to ask uh, and remind uh, uh, members of the Advisory Council that they can, uh, you can use the hand raise function if you have any questions or if you want to have, uh, you know, your comments be heard during this meeting. Uh, right now, we're going to move forward and we're going to hear from the single family residential program team followed by the multifamily program team and then by uh, the commercial uh, buildings team. Uh, so right now I'm going to hand it over to Courtney Moriarta, uh, who is the director of single family residential at NYSERDA. Courtney. Thanks, Thanks Luis, and good morning, everyone. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. So I want to start by um, giving everyone an update on what we've been accomplishing in the past year in our low and moderate income programs. Um, so in July of last year, we went through a, a big transition where we combined the assisted home performance and the existing Empower programs into one umbrella program that we have rebranded as Empower Plus. So we serve both low and moderate income households under the same brand umbrella and um, set of processes. So these combined programs in 2023 served over 22,000 homes. At the same time that we made that transition, we also launched the New York Home Energy Portal, which is a new uh, computer system, workflow system, and data management system that allows us um, to manage our projects using both the modeling tool for both Empower Plus and our residential energy assessment programs through the same portal. The Comfort Home program will also be integrated into the NIHAP portal in the summer of 2024. We're currently working on that. NYSERDA has also been working to incorporate our Inflation Reduction Act funding that Pam just talked about into the Empower Plus program. And this work has included submitting an early enablement application to DOE, which was submitted in December of 2023, that will allow us to integrate funding from uh, the home energy appliance rebate or the HERA program directly into the Empower Plus program so we can leverage our existing resources and contractor networks. We've been holding multiple stakeholder engagement sessions to support our IRA funding and our planning for how we'll deploy that funding. Um, that work has been ongoing since late last year um, and continues to go as we plan for how we're going to implement the full series of programs under the Inflation Reduction Act. And we're continuing to work on our systems and program planning um, to be able to launch those programs in full in late Q2 of this year. You can go to the next slide. So the Residential Energy Audit Program has also been busy. Um, we migrated the REA over to the NIHAP software tool, as I mentioned. Um, and that also gave us the opportunity to create a new customer facing audit report. So the energy audit report that comes out of um, that program has been revamped and updated. In 2023, we completed just over 3000 energy audits and we were able to engage with multiple vendors through our remote audit challenge um, to test and demonstrate different approaches for doing remote and virtual audits in the market. And we'll be using those learnings to inform future um, versions of how we may want to implement audits going forward. Some of the challenges that we've seen is that although we've seen some growth in the past couple of years, um, really since coming out of the pandemic, 
Uh, we would still like to increase participation statewide, and we do still have some pockets of New York State where there is some limited availability of contractors who can deliver audits to homeowners. Um, we also continue to um, observe that there is some lack of consumer awareness about the no cost residential energy audit program. So we're looking to improve awareness as well. Some of the changes that are under consideration is we are looking to take the findings and learnings from those remote audit challenge demonstration projects and use them to develop a vision for how we may be able to deliver virtual audits statewide um, in the future. And we can move to the next slide. Under our comfort home program, which is our market rate offer, um, that provides load reduction projects. And when I say load reduction, what I mean is uh, they're basically weatherization programs, envelope improvement um, projects that do insulation, air sealing, and in some cases support uh, some window upgrades. The Cumber Home Program um, has now 60 contractors that are participating in the program, and those are top quality contractors out of our existing contractor network um, as determined by their quality assurance scores. We have 9 that are very active and doing more than 5 market rate projects per month. Uh, we completed over almost 3500 load reduction projects since the inception of the program. And we've also delivered another 1600 assessments. So those would be projects that are in the line now. Some of the other outputs of this program have been updated to our New York State Technical Resource Manual. Where we've introduced something called uh, a standard simulation method. And what that does for us is it provides a calculation method that can be used to determine the energy savings in a standardized way for measure packages that can be delivered to homeowners um, so that we don't have to always do a complete comprehensive whole house energy simulation. We can just simulate um, the savings that we would get from doing the, um, the packages that we're offering for those load reduction. So in TRM version nine, we introduced the category five custom measure. And what that one does is it gives us a methodology for determining the energy savings for weatherization measure packages. And then this year in TRM version 11, we introduced category six, which adds in the ability to do not just weatherization packages, but weatherization plus heat pump packages. And this is important because it sets us up for success in being able to deliver uh, future programs with combined weatherization and heat pump packages. For utility coordination, um, one of the key aspects of our work in comfort home right now is working with the utilities that have programs where they're delivering weatherization um, rebates to customers in gas constrained areas. Uh, so it specifically with Con Ed and National Grid, and we're looking for ways to streamline the customer and contractor journey so that we don't have competing offers in the market. We're also focusing on contractor, increasing contractor participation and working with our contractors to help them with workforce development um, and building out their businesses to be able to deliver these, these services statewide. Next slide, please. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about today, this is more of an enabling initiative, um, but it's a pretty exciting new initiative that we deployed in late 2023. It's called Experience Clean Heat. And while it's based at commercial sites, it's really aimed at the general public and consumers. And the idea is that we have pilot sites that currently heat and cool with heat pumps um, that are public businesses. And we are looking to drive, we, put up signage um, and social media campaigns around those businesses. And we're looking to drive consumers to go and visit those businesses and experience what it's like to be in a building that has a heat pump um, so they can then talk about it and bring that home to their families and their friends um, and understand better really what a heat pump can do for them. So we currently have um, several sites that are already set up throughout the state and several more coming online soon. We've so far had 70,000 engagements through social media with our early rollout, and we're planning several tailored events to the sites um, 
including certain giveaways that would be planned for 2024. Um, and then last but not least, we are looking to expand this um, initiative to also have a contractor driven experience clean heat initiative. And in that case, what we would be looking to do is to create opportunities for people who work in the HVAC industry uh, to experience heat pumps firsthand in the places where they work and live uh, so that then they can take that to their customers and talk about um, the fact that they have heat pumps in their own homes and businesses uh, to help people understand the benefits of heat pumps. And I think with that, I'll let me turn that over to Luis. Thank you very much, Courtney. Uh, I appreciate the you know the precise summary that you just presented. So now we're going to move on to uh, multifamily initiatives, and I want to introduce uh, Will Shia, who's the director of multifamily residential. And I share that, Will. Thanks, Luis. Good morning, everybody. Um, you can go to the next slide, please, Luis. So first up, I did want to give an update on our multifamily performance program. This has been sort of our you know, one of our flagship programs that have been around for quite some time. Um, what's changed since the last meeting is that this program has since closed the new applications in February of 2022. This was done in coordination with the utilities who essentially at the same time started up their AMI program or affordable multifamily energy efficiency program. However, that doesn't necessarily mean we're not still overseeing this program. We still have a remaining pipeline of about 40 plus projects that we are still managing through to completion. The MPP program is for affordable multifamily housing buildings across New York State. Um, and we are planning to ensure that all of these projects get completed by the end of December 2025. So essentially the first clean energy fund period. We've done quite a bit in terms of providing both incentives and services to well over 30,000 dwelling units across the state. So this has been really, really um, beneficial for us. And it's also been our springboard for additional types of studies, such as the uh, heat pump demonstration study, essentially adding on to the scope of some of these multifamily projects and, and essentially testing out um, the heat pump component of that as well. So, although close the new apps, it still remains one of the programs that we are seeing through the completion, right, through the end of 25. Next slide, please, Luis. Luis and team, sorry, I'm not quite showing the slides directly. Um, a, a newer program that we've also since launched, since last we've spoken on multifamily programs, is the Low Carbon Pathways Program. This was launched in back in mid-2021. Um, with a with an eye towards New York City's local law 97, right? So the building performance standard for emissions for buildings less than 25,000 square feet, right? So we're really trying to demonstrate a measure packaged approach, right? Um, starting from when buildings and building owners and decision makers are thinking about their planning in terms of what they're looking to do and essentially working with them every step of the way to ensure that the decarbonization measures get complete. Right, the photos on the right show a building in Lower Manhattan, which recently completed its installation, utilizing both NYSERDA's incentives through this program, as well as New York State Clean Heat. Um, and that's the International Tailoring Company building, right? So we are looking to uh, do as many of these types of projects as we can, again, through the end of the 2025 period. Um, and just one note for both this program and the previous one, this is really done on in partnership with our multifamily building solutions network, which is our, our network of contractors and solution providers. Uh, we're looking forward to continue to work with this cohort and bring in more folks to join this network um, with one eye towards the future, right? So Pam had mentioned our, uh, our recent partial approval on the here scope, right? So down the road, we are also looking to provide IRE incentives for multifamily buildings. We're currently working through what that may look like now. And one key aspect for what future design looks like is building off of this network that we already have and essentially trying to uh, roll out a new one-stop shop approach. So just a quick note on that. Um, next slide, please. 
Shifting gears to our technical assistance offerings, right? So we were talking about project incentives just earlier. Um, now shifting gear to FlexTech, another one of NYSERDA's key flagship programs, right? This is um, primarily through Jamie Marcotte and our EPE team. However, that team also oversees a great amount of multifamily projects, right? So essentially providing cost share to uh, design firms that are able to perform energy studies on behalf of our clients. We've since updated this program at the end of 2023 to essentially streamline it a bit, right? And meet the market where it is. So after extensive uh, voice of the customer engagement, right? We've since mod uh, modified the program slightly. Um, and the key focus here, right? Is now there is a 75% cost share as opposed to 50 for multifamily buildings that are uh, identified as affordable, right? So this is a key program, not just for folks to understand their building's energy baseline and consumption, but also to think about what they can do, how they can then go to other programs, such as the utility Amy program, the CERTA programs, um, and really trying to coordinate what this output is with the integrated physical needs assessment, right? Which the uh, Green Jobs Green New York team will be talking about a little bit as well. So a lot done to date through this program and a lot more coming down the pike as well. Next slide. And I think the next slide is the last one for multifamily. Um, to, to sum up, I did want to just highlight a couple of key programs that we're doing in partnership with our affordable housing agency partners, right? That's the New York State Homes and Community Renewal, New York City Housing and Preservation Development, as well as NYCHA, right? New York City Housing Authority. Um, a program that we had launched again since the last we spoke as a group here is the Direct Injection Program, also known as Clean Energy Initiative. It's, uh, it's really looking to provide NYSERDA capital essentially to our agency partners directly so that they can include it when they are providing financing to buildings pursuing 4% and 9% uh, low income housing tax credit or subsidy financing. So it's really been a great uh, way to provide certainty and funds upfront to regulate affordable housing, right? Currently going through the financing. Um, that um, initiative has been going well. We've committed $100 million to HCR to um, work on this through 2025. And we've since um, started up a similar type of program with our city partners as well. So that's HPD. Right, essentially the same type of approach, provide them with the funds directly so that they can then uh, include it in their uh, capital stacks for projects. Finally, lastly, the highlight is the Clean Heat for All program, um, which some folks may have heard of, but it's really more of a uh, tech challenge, innovation challenge, right? Call to manufacturers to um, develop a cold climate packaged water. A packaged window heat pump that essentially sits kind of like a saddle in, in windows, right? Um, that can be replicable, replicable throughout NYCHA's building stock. Essentially, NYSERDA is providing cost share along with the New York Power Authority to test out from two manufacturers, Medea and Gradient, one international, one domestic, to see if they can, if this unit can run efficiently and provide both heating and cooling for, for residents throughout the heating season. We feel very uh, bullish about this. It's currently wrapping up its MMV of the current 24 and 25, 23 and 24 heating season. If all goes well, contractually, there is an option to expand this, right? To purchase up to 30,000 units, right? So that will be potentially quite a big uh, achievement, right? With our agency partners. That's it for multifamily. I'll turn it back to Luis. Here the next portion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We well, really appreciate it. Uh, now we're gonna uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to introduce Tim Curry, who is a contractor in our work on efficiency planning and engineering for small commercial updates. So, Tim, please. Thank you, Luis. Um, yeah, my name is Tim. I've been working on the small commercial side of green jobs for the past almost four years now. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, the Green Jobs, Green New York studies, uh, the main int intent is to provide customers with objective information on energy efficiency opportunities. 
Um, so it's available to small businesses of 100 full-time employees or less, nonprofits of any size statewide, and in facilities that must be 50,000 square feet or less. That's one of the most recent changes that we've made to the eligibility for participants. Uh, I believe that was last summer. Um, and yeah, the main point is to give, you know, comprehensive whole building studies, calculations and recommendations on energy efficiency. Uh, we also coordinate with the communities team and CEAs to support next steps towards implementation, financing and other utility programs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to date, these are the, you know, the measures that have been identified throughout the studies. Um, over 1800 measures have been reviewed. Majority of the savings come from interior and exterior lighting retrofits. Um, the controls is mostly implementing a nighttime setback, deeper setbacks and improved temperature control. Motors are mostly VFD installations and HVAC and domestic hot water measures uh, generally include electrification options uh, or opportunities. At least every study, I think in the past two years have included electrification options or at least an analysis of that feasibility. Um, and yeah, every year, you know, we're getting more and more studies, more applications, and I find that it is probably the most affordable energy study you can get, at least in New York State. Um, but yeah, I have a short section here, so that is my last slide. Um, and yeah, feel free to move on. All right, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, that was a you know, very nice summary of all the work that you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so now uh, I would like to uh, move on to uh, talk about the Green Jobs for New York Residential Fund. And for that, I'd like to introduce Helen Clark, who's a program manager in the Finance and Solutions team and who manages uh, the program. So Heather. Thank you, Luis. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending. I appreciate it. Um, so the residential loan fund, we work uh, with the other programs, especially Empower Plus, um, Comfort Home, uh, New York Sun, and uh, the New York State Clean Heat um, Program. Um, pursuant uh, to Title IX A of the New York State Public Authorities Law, the Green Job Green New York Program directs NYSERDA to establish a loan fund to finance the cost of approved qualified energy efficiency services for residential, multifamily, and non-residential sectors. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, for an overview, for those of you that are not uh, very familiar with the program, um, pursuant to the legislation which enacted the Green Jobs Green New York, all loans must have an energy assessment or audit. Um, the legislation also requires cost effectiveness criteria, uh, pre qualified measures of at least 85% of the total loan amount, or a savings to investment ratio of 80%. Um, and for on bill recovery loans, um, it's the 112 rule in which the uh, monthly savings must meet or exceed the monthly loan payment. And for both on bill recovery and smart energy loans, um, loans that exceed $13,000 must meet a 15 year payback. Um, loans are available to customers if the contractor is approved through either a NYSERDA program or a utility program. Our loans are unsecured. Uh, the 3.99% is a baseline rate. Um, minimum loan amount is 1500, max is 25,000. And um, for on bill recovery and automatic withdrawals, there is a half a percentage discount. We have terms of 5 to 10, 5, 10 and 15 years, um, but the term of the loan cannot exceed the expected useful life of the measures. And there are no prepayment penalties for our program. Um, next slide, please. The, these numbers are based on the uh, annual report from, from September 2023 and are uh, as of June 30th, 2023. Uh, we have a total revolving loan um, fund total budget of $203 million, just over the 203. Um, we've expended 168.8. Uh, we've committed 2.7 and we have a remaining balance of 31.6. Again, these numbers were as of June 2023. 
Next slide, please. Since 2022, we've seen an increase in smart energy loans and a decrease in on bill recovery loans. Um, 2021 was an outlier due to the pandemic and the 0% loan that we offered in an effort to assist contractors build back business after the pandemic. And 2022 and 2023 saw constant growth during uh, economic recovery and we are seeing increase in loans being issued. Next slide, please. So the dollar value of loans issued in the past year is approximately 5 million a month, which is within the amounts of, uh, approved in the Reggie operating plan. Um, we're working collaboratively with the New York State Clean Heat Campaign to promote and raise awareness of our Green Jobs Green New York loans. We saw an increase in the funding of air source and ground source heat pump projects with a 64% increase in loans issued between March 2023 and March 2024. Um, between April 23 and March 24, we issued loans for nearly 4,000 projects with an aggregate amount of almost $71 million. Energy efficiency projects were 10% of the number of loans issued. Air source and ground source were 24%. And solar projects were 66% or 46.6 million of the total loan amounts issued. Next slide, please. So over 41,000 residential green jobs, green New York loans valued at nearly $526 million have been issued statewide since 2010. The top five counties with an aggregate amount of loans issued over $20 million are Erie, Monroe, Westchester, Nassau, and Suffolk. Next slide, please. So potential loan fund changes or opportunities for improvements. NYSERDA is proposing the following changes to the Green Jobs Green New York statute under a departmental bill proposal. Um, the first is OBR transferability. So that upon the sale or transfer of a property subject to an existing loan, the original borrower may obtain express written voluntary acceptance by the purchaser or transferee of the property to accept the remaining charges on the OBR loan. And unless we, uh, the, the uh, signed acceptance has been received and submitted, the original borrower will be responsible for either paying off the loan in full or will be able to make uh, continuing direct loan payments. As the result of this change, the recordation of the loan in the municipal recording office would be eliminated which will reduce processing time for borrowers and contractors, reduce confusion during a property sale or transfer, and provide substantial program cost savings, um, estimated at $575,000 a year. Um, we are also proposing to remove the 15-year payback requirement. Currently, as I stated, loans exceeding $13,000 must pass a 15-year payback requirement, meaning that the savings must pay for the measure within 15 years. Removing this requirement will allow more air source and ground source heat pump system installations to access the green jobs loans. The next is uh, the maximum loan amount. The cost for the installation of energy efficiency measures have naturally increased over the past few years, given inflation. And this has led uh, homeowners to obtain an initial loan through NYSERDA nice Green Jobs Green New York program, and then having to take a secondary loan to cover the balance of costs, further increasing the cost to their uh, customers for their energy efficiency and renewable energy um, projects. Um, so this suggested opportunity would provide homeowners with the ability to fund their projects solely through NYSERDA Green Jobs Green New York loan and by allowing loans to cover the higher costs instead of having to seek a secondary and more often expensive funding. So NYSERDA is currently working with the legislature to raise the bill this session for consideration. Next slide please. So with the objectives of increasing efficiency, reducing cost, and making these loans more accessible to those in the low income demographic and disadvantaged communities, we're suggesting two updates to the program's interest rates. 
The first is to change the eligibility for the lower rates to only those customers that meet the New York State Disadvantaged Community Criteria or in a census block group identified as 50% as or more of the population of the group has a household income of less than or equal to 80% uh, area median income, or we call them designated areas. Customers that live outside of these designated areas that can provide uh, household income documentation to show that the household income is at the less than or 80% AMI would also be eligible for the lower rates. Customers not in a designated area are able to show that their household income is less than or 80% AMI would only be eligible for the higher rates. The second uh, proposed change is to recalibrate our interest rates to better reflect market conditions. Customers within a designated area or the household income of less than or equal to 80% area median income would go from a 3.49% interest rate to 4.5%, um, including a 0.5% uh, discount for OBR and uh, smart energy using automatic withdrawals. Similarly, for customers outside of the designated area or with a household income of greater than 80% AMI, we go from a 7.49% to 8.5%, again, including a half a percentage discount for OBR and smart energy using ACH. So thank you again. Um, this concludes my portion of the presentation, Luis. Thank you, Heather. Next slide, please. So again, thank you very much to my colleagues and Nicerda for you know your presentations. I believe it gave a very good summary of all the work that's been going on under the Green Jobs Green New York umbrella. Uh, at this point, I would like to invite the members of the advisory council uh, to issue you know any quest to have like if you have any question, any comment, any suggestion, please. This would be a great moment for you to raise your voice. Uh, if you are on WebEx, please uh, look at there is a hand raise function that you can use to call attention. Uh, I mean, right now, what we heard was, you know, on the single family residential, we heard about how the assisted home performance and empower programs combined to create empower plus and how these in combination have served more than 22,000 homes. We also heard about the market rate uh, program and how we're working with some top quality contractors where at least nine of them are working, you know, doing more than five projects uh, every month. And we are talking about how more than 3,400 low reduction projects uh, were performed this year. Uh, we also heard from Will on the multifamily performance program. We heard how uh, it has served more than 31,000 dwelling units and how it has achieved uh, annual, annual customer bill reductions in, more, in, in the order of 2.8 million and more than 14,000 metric tons of CO2 reduction. He, he also talked about the low uh, carbon pathways program that we're implementing, supporting the city of New York with implementation of local law 97. And, and we talk about the flexible technical assistance program that uh, right now has uh, spent in incentives more than 26 million and supporting more than 628 projects. Uh, he talked about the collaboration with the, with the different agencies at the state uh, level and also in New York City, and how we are working with them to accelerate the pace of electrification and decarbonization as a whole. Tim uh, told us about the, the or perhaps the most affordable uh, feasibility study that we can do for small commercial projects in New York State. And then we talked about the, the loan fund. We talked about, uh, you know, we, we had a snapshot of the performance of the loan fund, but at the end, we, you know, Heather mentioned a couple of changes that we are proposing, you know, to make the program more efficient, to increase the maximum loan amount, and to do without a requirement that currently is preventing us from funding some ground source heat pump projects, for example. And then we talked about how, despite, you know, uh, inflationary pressures, the program uh, has continued to serve uh, low-income New Yorkers and, and supporting them as we recover from the pandemic, but at this point we're suggesting a recalibration of this program. So in any of these topics, we are very interested in hearing from you. If you have, again, any question, any comment, please, I would invite you to do so. Hi. 
Um, 15 years, boy, time flies when you're having fun. Um, it's amazing. Congratulations to you all. It's really, really impressive what you've accomplished. Um, I'm, I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed at what you accomplish, but I'm always interested in finding out what the resistance factors are, where, where are things not working out quite as planned or envisioned and in each of these areas, what, what, what are you, what are the roadblocks? What are the hurdles that you're coming across that makes them maybe not doing as much as they could be doing or as you want them to do? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Les. I think, uh, you know, the different speakers touch on that. So I'd like to call on, on Courtney uh, Moriarta first. Uh, she did mention a couple of challenges, actually, in her second slide. Uh, the implementation of some of these programs. So, Courtney, if you want to start us off here. Yeah, sure. And thanks for the question, Les. Um, so, I think really there's there's two key areas that we've been focused on. Um, one is really sort of overcoming um, some of the sort of misinformation maybe that's out there around heat pumps and and gaining more confidence in the in the technology as we kind of transition our are thinking away from just traditional energy efficiency and more towards decarbonization. So that's really what the experience clean heat initiative is all about is hope it is helping to kind of overcome some of that lack of confidence that um, the kind of the general public and some of the HVAC community has in adopting um, electrification measures more rapidly. So that's one area. Um, and then I think the other area that I did touch on as well is, you know, we continue to see workforce development as being a challenge just kind of across the board for everyone. Um, and I think that's consistent, you know, with pretty much any industry, but, you know, just finding the the people who can do the work and, and helping um, businesses to kind of grow and expand is always a challenge for us. Thanks, Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. Will, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, sounds good. Um, thanks, Les, for the question. Um, I think on the multifamily side, what Courtney said on the awareness side for use of the equipment definitely is a challenge on the multifamily side as well. I would say two other things um, really come down to timing and coordination from the timing perspective. It's the for multifamily projects with longer lead times for development for lining up construction, you know, we're, we're talking several years realistically, right? And with several years of a time frame, leads to a lot of areas where there can be delays, right? And then you layer on on top, well, no pun intended. You layer on on top of that the layering that folks do of incentives, right? Between NYSERDA, the utilities, are. Um, weatherization assistance program colleagues right on the HCR side, right? Every group of contractors and funding award cycles, payment award cycles is just slightly different um, between these programs. And if you don't line those up, then things can stretch on, right? In terms of needing extensions, right? So that ties to the coordination piece, right? So how do you coordinate with not just the uh, decision makers on the building side, but also all the other people that are also doing work with the same owners, right? It is a challenge, right? So that's what's top of mind for us less, right? As we think about what future programs need to look like and how they need to look different. So, thank you. I, I, I live that world, so I, I, I can appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, Tim, do you have any insights uh, on your side for the commercial? Yeah. Um... Uh, the biggest roadblock is money. Um, you know, non for profits, they don't, they're not for profit. You know, <laughs> they don't get that much money. So they don't have uh, large influxes of cash to, you know, install energy efficiency measures. And they're often relying on other grants, which in order to get the grant, they need to get an energy study. And there's kind of this, you know, domino effect of financial incentives that we can offer. Um, that they're kind of dependent on in order to reduce their carbon and either avoid any penalties from either, you know, cities, you know, carbon laws and all of that. So I think, you know, the biggest thing comes down to is funding to implement these, um, which I, which is why I think the small commercial energy study portion of it is a great offering because I think the max cost a customer pays for an energy study is $500. Um, and they get a pretty robust energy study. You know, they get a 
enough information to make decisions on, you know, what measures they can actually install. Um, you know, it's not down to a design level, but for $500, they can figure out how to save well more than that. Um, and yeah, it just comes down to getting that funding to implement, um, which is why I think the CEAs and the other community kind of organizations we work with to help the customers um, really makes a big difference. And yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, what it really boils down to on my side. Thank you, Thanks. team. Uh, Heather? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Les. I appreciate the question. Um, really, the hurdles that we've seen are those um, that we're trying to to uh, change under the departmental bill proposal. Um, you know, the first is the um, bill recovery transferability. Um, we have noted that uh, it, it's often confusing for buyers of a, a property where that OBR um, loan is attached to the utility. Uh, it's not transferred as easily um, or as uh, um, smoothly in some cases as possible. Um, and it's also very expensive. You know, we have to pay uh, for the filing fees for the declarations and then filing fees for the satisfactions. Uh, so if we could free up that money instead of paying those fees, we can give uh, more loans. You know, at, at $575,000 a year, that's, that's a good number of loans that we could, uh, you know, originate. You know, and the other hurdle is the 15 year payback requirement, um, you know, allowing the air source and ground source heat pump projects, uh, we would be able to fund more of those um, right now, sometimes at the 15 year or it's not passing if the, the loan is over $13,000. So, again, the homeowner. Um, borrows the first $13,000 from us and then may have to go get an alternative funding source that's higher cost to pay the remaining amount of the, the project costs. And, uh, you know, the other hurdle is the maximum loan amount. Um, inflation, you know, things are more expensive than they were in 2009 uh, when the legislation was first passed. And uh, the $25,000 cap is really uh, prohibitive uh, for folks to be able to finance the whole project through our group. What are, you, what are you seeing the paybacks on the air source and ground source heat pumps? You say they're not meaning 15 years, which I understand, but what are they coming in at? Um, it really depends upon what they're converting from. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, different fuel sources. It changes the, the savings, uh, you know, annual yeah. savings. And in some cases, it's very low or negative. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate that. It's very helpful. Thank you. Liz. I think. Yeah, I think in general, what we can see is that we are doing an explicit effort to identify all the different challenges ahead and try to coordinate uh, within NYSERDA to make sure that we're addressing this in the most efficient possible way. Uh, is there anybody else from the advisory council that would like to uh, have a comment or uh, participate somehow in the discussion? Okay, I guess then we can uh, move forward. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. I'd like to introduce Adele Ferranti, who is the Director of Workforce Development and Training at NYSERDA to take us through updates on the Workforce Development Front. Adele. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you again and Les, I think I've been here all 15 years with you and, and some of the <laughs> others. So thank you. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about our workforce development and training efforts and I know Courtney, for example, mentioned an issue with labor supply, which is real. You know, for me, labor supply is one component and then training that labor force is separate and uh, related, of course, but a separate effort. And the programs that we're implementing today in our workforce development and training portfolio focus on training new workers for clean energy jobs with a focus on workers from disadvantaged communities and priority populations as well as upskilling existing workers so that they're ready and able to work in the clean energy economy. The first program I just wanna highlight is our building operations and maintenance training program. Since approximately 2018, we funded over 80 projects with property management companies and building owners, looking at all the workers in a portfolio that touch building 
energy systems, those operations and maintenance workers. We've provided about $18.3 million to train and upskill over 7,000 building operators in this program alone. Another effort I wanna mention, and these efforts that I'm talking about on this slide are really building that training capacity, whether it's working with a community college, a union, um, manufacturers, community-based organizations. In the offshore wind training program, we funded four projects to date, and those projects will train 330 new workers with at least 50% of those coming from disadvantaged communities and priority populations for nearly $3 million in total funding. And as I mentioned, we're building training capacity. So even when these projects are over, those training programs will continue because they're trying to develop sustainable training models. We funded work uh, related to clean energy uh, and HVAC career pathways. That's again, training for new workers, which typically includes soft skills training, technical skills training, uh, job placement services, wraparound services. And to date, we've awarded almost $17 million, supporting over 16,000 New Yorkers across 58 projects, both for new and existing workers. And again, we're, we're hitting a target of 50% of those trainings coming from disadvantaged communities and priority populations. And finally, this year, we issued a new solicitation, which is really targeted at unions or direct entry pre-apprenticeship training programs. It's uh, $15 million this year alone and a total of $45 million over three years to expand that training capacity, again, for direct entry programs, pre-apprenticeship programs that will lead to union jobs and for registered apprenticeship programs that are training apprentices and journey workers on clean energy technologies. And in those programs, we can either help them expand their existing clean energy training or develop new clean energy training. And all these projects are designed to support real business needs. There has to be business commitments, involvement, and these projects are serving those business training needs. Next slide, please. And so as I talked about um, building the training capacity, at the same time, we're helping employers and uh, new entrants into the market get hands-on training on the job. And the first initiative I wanna talk about is our Climate Justice Fellowship Program. Uh, that program's been up and running for about two years. And in this program, we provide a $40,000 a year st salary and stipend for fellows to work in clean energy or climate justice projects with climate justice focused organizations and those projects have to benefit a disadvantaged community. It's a 12 month position. We provide $37,000 in salary and $3,000 in supportive services or professional de development services. Um, we've funded about $2 million in fellows to date. I think we're just over 50 fellows working throughout the state. And we think of these as the young, the young, young leaders of the future. This is an opportunity to bring new workers into the clean energy climate justice space and have them work in, a, in an organization for 12 months. Another example, next slide please. And I know some of you are very familiar with the on the job training program, which we've been really running through the beginning of Green Jobs Green New York. And this is now funded under the Clean Energy Fund and Reggie. And we are working with clean energy employers in the uh, Following the areas listed here, anywhere from high efficiency HVAC and heat pumps, energy storage, solar electric, EV charging station installation and operation. It's a wage reimbursement program where we typically provide an employer with a wage subsidy of about $8,000. And it's anywhere from 50 to 75% of that wage for four to six months with higher incentives for MWBE, service disabled veteran owned businesses and heat pump hires specifically. It's a great way for us to work with employers who are bringing on new employees to reduce the risk of bringing on those new employees in an area where maybe the market demand isn't certain yet. And it's a way for those employers to bring those new workers up to full productivity as quickly as possible. To date, we've helped about 200 businesses hire 1800 new workers through the on the job training program 
and we're seeing a 34% uh, success rate for individuals being hired from disadvantaged communities or priority populations. And uh, to date, we've spent almost $15 million on this program. Again, the average wage subsidy is anywhere from eight to $10,000 per worker. Next slide, please. And the final program I just want to highlight, and this is really a way for us to bring new workers into the clean energy economy. And it, we talk about the need for new workers. We need to give these young adults or transitioning workers some experience in clean energy and internships have been a great way to do that. We provide incentives for employers to hire interns anywhere from 75 to 90% of those interns wages. That averages anywhere from four to five thousand dollars an intern. They can work full time in the summer. They could work part time over a couple of semesters. Um, the employer and the interns uh, apply to NYSERDA. We help the uh, employer find an intern, or they can bring an intern to us. We've supported uh, 320 employers to date in the internship program, with over 2,000 interns being hired, and um, we also can support individuals from party populations or disadvantaged communities that maybe are not going to college but want to be an intern. And to date, we have funded about $13 million for interns. One final point I want to make as you think about internships and fellowships and on the job training, we allow folks to leverage all of these programs. You can hire an intern for, let's say, the summer, and perhaps you want to bring them on as a fellow for a year. You can combine those programs. And even after you have them for 12 months as a fellow, you could hire them full time under the on the job training program. Likewise, you could work with an intern who works out really well and hire them full time under the on the job training program, combining all those incentives. So that's just a quick glimpse of how we're building training capacity while at the same time supporting employers and new entrants into the workforce through fellowships, internships, and on the job training. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adele. Uh, this is impressive, you know, almost as impressive as you and Les being here from the beginning of Green Jobs Green New York. Uh, now, if we move to the next slide, please. Uh, we got an update on the community based outreach work here at NYSERDA, and we have the Director of Energy and Climate Equity, Ansala Alossi, who is going to take us through this. Please. Oh, I apologize. Les, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, hi, Adele. We were even people once on this committee, yes. Um, so, you know, when government comes and knocks on business's door and says, hi, we're here to help, um, business usually runs the other direction. Um, and I imagine this program, you know, I, I'm look, look I, I try to talk my, my contractors, my subcontractors into this, and, and I'm always met with resistance. They're always afraid. What, what, are, what are you seeing from the business world in, in, in this effort? Yeah, Les, that's really a good point. I was recently at the North Country Chamber of Commerce, and they were trying to work with a few of their HVAC and heat pump installers in the region and to uh, introduce them to these programs. And they talked about the reluctance of the HVAC contractors in the North Country in this example. They don't want to work with government. They don't want us meddling in their business. They don't, they, they don't think the money is worth the paperwork. Um, and we have offered to bring some existing partners in our program to talk to them directly about their involvement in the on the job training program, for example. So we want to do more outreach with existing contractors to talk to other contractors about e how easy the program actually is. And we think that's one way less to really overcome some of those barriers. Yeah, that would be a great, great, great plan. And, and you know, also bringing some of the, the candidates, some of the people they've hired, you know, because business can be afraid of, you know, who they are, whatever you want to refer to they as. Um, yeah. But we take, are, taking the scare factor out is an important thing for business. Yeah, that's another great point. We are developing more and more case studies of successful candidates that have been hired through internships, fellowships, and on-the-job training. And I forgot to mention our great partners in the on-the-job training program, the New York State Department of Labor, and their business service representatives across the state are working closely with businesses to alleviate some of the concerns and barriers, and they work with them very closely to develop training plans under the program. Great. I might tap on you to come down to New York City and, and run that show. <laughs> okay, happy to help. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Adele and Liz. Uh, so, uh, Anne Southern. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to walk you through some of NYSERDA's initiatives and efforts to ensure that community based information with frontline communities is being received and implemented through our program design and policy design. Next slide. So I want to begin by talking about a recent launch of the Energy Equity Collaborative, which is a collaborative of uh, 13 community based organizations that are represented uh, geographically represented across the New York state uh, that are is designed to provide meaningful input and serve as an advisory body on our program initiatives and policies. We also have um, other state agencies that participate in the collaborative as well, such as the Department of Labor, DPS, uh, the Department of State, and we meet monthly to discuss initiatives, program development, and policy. Part of the collaborative is to uh, ensure that meaningful community based input is uh, captured at the early onset of program design so that it is informed with frontline communities in mind. The engagement staff is also representative of targeted communities previously excluded Black, Latino, Indigenous, and people of color. And there are uh, possess fluent and bilingual and culturally appropriate staff where uh, needed. There are, uh, at this point in the stage of the collaborative, there are topical working groups that are in flight. So there are four working groups that are substantive and the co collaborative is in the process of opening up membership to additional community-based organizations to have an even wider scope and larger breadth of information. Collaborative members are compensated uh, for their time and expertise through our DAC reimbursement and uh, stakeholder services pool. Next slide, please. The next initiative that I would like to talk about is our regional clean energy hubs. And so my understanding is that the last meeting, the re regional clean energy hubs was still in conceptual stage. And they are now fully operational and have been stood up for the past year. They are the result of an extensive co design process that took place back in 2019, which included 30 organizations from around New York State. The Regional Clean Energy Hubs Initiative launched in 2022. And $61 million has been allocated over four years to establish hubs in each of the economic development regions of New York State. These regional clean energy hubs are delivered through community based organizations and nonprofit uh, organizations with a demonstrated reach and connection in disadvantaged communities. So there are 12 hubs in total, three centralized in New York City. Next slide, please. What is unique about the hubs is that the hubs are a team of trusted, knowledgeable, community-based organizations in and from the regions they serve. They also have experience with clean energy, energy efficiency, workforce development and economic development, education, health, and housing. So looking at a holistic approach to advancing and providing information around clean energy services. The regional clean energy hubs are also funded through the clean energy fund and green regional greenhouse gas initiative. Next slide. Just to dial down a little bit into um, some of the. Pieces that a community based organization that is uh, is the lead of the strategic development and management of the hubs. With support from NYSERDA staff and the hubs team at here at NYSERDA. And due to the population density of New York City region, three hubs are established to uh, serve the unique needs of the borough's population. Right now, uh, the what are some in flight initiatives for the regional in, uh, clean energy hubs as we move forward are energy literacy workshops. And these uh, energy literacy workshops will uh, uh, provide um, 
energy education opportunities as part of events campaigns or as standalone events, community campaigns, which will be uh, conducted to target that move forward a more robust technology agnostic model that will promote a range of clean energy technologies and solutions and growing the network. So the hubs are always in the business of fostering and forming new relationships with external entities and partners currently operating in disadvantaged communities to increase access and participation in clean energy programs and solutions. And some of the numbers that surround the clean energy hub over the past year from in, in 2023, about 2,500 referrals to clean energy programs have been made. Referrals to clean heat programs have been made. And the hubs through their community events, workshops, and um, combined events have reached uh, approximately 70,000 New Yorkers in their first year of operation. And I think that is our summary. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any questions, so uh, we can continue with the evaluation section. Uh, we have Victoria Engel Faust, uh, program manager leading the market characterization and evaluation uh, work at NYSERDA. So, Victoria. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Luis. And I'll just say, kind of tee this up that our evaluation work kind of runs the gamut. Um, in particular, what we were doing is looking at with third party consultants, looking to verify the impacts that our programs here are reporting and then also taking a look at market influence. What are the reasons? What are the barriers? What are the motivations for participants to be adopting clean energy? So, and that's done through like um, you know, surveys and other data collection efforts. So the, the studies that I'm going to describe in here kind of run the gamut of both of those, those pieces. So next slide, please. I'll start off with some work that we are undertaking in the single family res space. We have a residential audit um, and rating measure adoption rate assessment. And this study is looking to quantify the percentage of measures that are recommended in those audits that are ultimately installed. So we're, we're doing this through surveys and other sort of data collection methods to assess what was in the studies and what was actually installed in homes. As part of that study, we're also looking to verify those impacts, both electricity and fuel. And we're also doing a survey of participants to learn more about their decision making, exploring if other additional efficient or clean energy measures may have been adopted, and also to assess any sort of non energy benefits that they're seeing from the installation of those measures. We have studies occurring in the space of Empower Plus as well as Comfort Home. These are two separate studies, but they have the same sort of mission, which is to evaluate those uh, energy impacts. And we're assessing that by measure, by fuel, and by contractor. We're also doing surveys of participants and contractors to learn more about their behaviors and their decision making, and then also to see how contractor practices are affecting the installation of measures and those, those savings. Uh, we're also trying to incorporate some real time analysis to get some early feedback to program staff. Uh, that may allow for some tweaking or some adjustments, perhaps to their to their um, to their work. Uh, this work is underway right now for both of those studies in power and power plus and comfort home, and they will be done in about a year. Next slide, please. In the space of multifamily residential, we have a multifamily performance program impact evaluation that is just getting underway now. Uh, we are in particular looking at. Uh, savings that are occurring in disadvantaged community areas. Uh, the first phase, as I said, is just getting underway right now for projects that have been completed through 2022, pending the result of that of that analysis and sort of the status of subsequent uh, projects. Uh, we'll go on to phase two, but as of right now, the phase one work is underway and we expect that will be done about this time next year. We are also doing a flex tech impact evaluation. Again, given the nature of this programming, we're going to be doing a measure adoption rate analysis, which is again looking at what is recommended in studies versus what is actually installed. We'll be verifying those impacts. And this work is just getting underway right now. And again, next year will be a big year, I guess, in the evaluation study, because that will be due um, about a year from now. Next slide, please. We have evaluation underway for workforce development as well. This is looking at not only the 
impacts that are reported through the program itself, but then also doing a market assessment to ascertain what sort of impacts are happening outside of the bounds of NYSERDA's programming and training and such. So we're doing that. Um, we're looking at projects that are still in process right now through a real time evaluation. We're taking a look back at projects that have been completed before uh, to assess their impacts along the way. And those results are expected later on this year. Next slide, please. And then lastly, wanted to hone in on some disadvantaged community and LMI activities that are being undertaken in the evaluation space. We're very excited about a real regional clean energy hubs market baseline that is happening right now, which will be assessing customer awareness of clean energy opportunities and barriers, monitoring the success of the, of the hubs and developing those relationships, as Anzlo was talking about a few minutes ago, and also characterizing what energy actions are being undertaken in those disadvantaged community areas. Uh, this work is wrapping up right now, actually, and we should be having results probably in the next couple of months. And then lastly, wanted to touch base on a low income bill and usage analysis. This came about from a series of public service commission orders. 1 of which uh, was released in 2021 uh, related to the energy affordability policy, which um, directed NYSERDA to conduct a low, this low income average bill and usage analysis to look at the energy burden that low income communities face in New York state and how that changes with clean energy and efficiency, other efficiency investments. The study uh, will comprise of a characterization of the low income market sector, looking at the energy burden and analysis of how clean energy, energy affordability and efficiency interventions change energy consumption and thus energy burden. Uh, this work is just getting underway as well right now, and we expect results beginning to middle of next year. That's it for eval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we can move to the next slide, please. So right now in this last section, you know, we heard about workforce development and all the work that we're doing and the success that we're having in reaching uh, priority populations. Uh, we heard about the clean energy hubs and now the work that is undergoing right now and how we are tracking the pace of progress and the impact that our programs are having, always with the objective of do better and, and be better at reaching those populations that we need to reach. Uh, at this point, I would like to ask if uh, members of the advisory council have any questions or any comment that you wanna share with the rest of us. If you do, please uh, use the raise hand function in WebEx. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, I wanna thank everybody who's here today, those who presented a summary of the work being done at NYSERDA and the members of the advisory council, of course, for being here. We are always uh, you know, open to uh, any comment, any suggestion, any feedback that you may have on what you heard today. At any point, it doesn't need to be in these meetings. Uh, feel free to reach out directly to Heather Clark or myself uh, with any questions. And remember that our annual report is posted on our website. Uh, and uh, this year we'll be updating this report uh, around September. So with this, we want to just thank you for being here and uh, see you next year. We'll probably we'll hear from you before that, right? Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, bye.